All right. Um, I think we're ready to start. Uh, good evening. My name is John Foran. I'm the executive director of Miami University's Menard Family Center for Democracy. And on behalf of the university and our partners at the Journal News and the League of Women Voters of Oxford, it's my pleasure to welcome you to tonight's debate featuring candidates who are running to represent represent Ohio's newly created 47th House District in the Ohio General Assembly. The winner of this race will begin a two-year term in the Ohio House of Representatives in January. First, let me thank tonight's participating candidates, Democratic Party nominee Sam Lawrence and Republican Party nominee Sarah Carruthers for joining us in this discussion, and each candidate will be introducing themselves more fully in a moment. Let me also introduce my fellow moderators for tonight's debate, uh, Jennifer Fisher, who is co-president of the League of Women Voters of Oxford, and Michael Pittman, who covers local politics and community fair affairs for the Journal News. I would also like to thank the diverse array of community organizations throughout Southwest Ohio who have provided invaluable help to us in putting this forum together and publicizing it throughout the region. They include the Fairfield Chamber of Commerce, the Hamilton Chamber of Commerce, the Chamber of Commerce serving Middletown, Trenton, Monroe and Trenton, the Oxford NAACP, the Middletown NAACP, Greater Hamilton Coalition Against Hate, Miami Valley Farmers Union, the Hamilton YWCA, the Bethel AME Church in Oxford, 3R Development in Middletown, the Payne Chapel AME Church in Hamilton, the Cincinnati Dayton District AMA Church Social Action Committee, the Oxford Citizen, Citizens for Peace and Justice, and the League of Women Voters of Eastern Butler County. Now, tonight's debate will begin with brief opening statements by each of the candidates who will speak in alphabetical order by last name. And after these candidate statements, then we'll move to roughly 45 to 50 minutes of questions, which will touch on a wide range of issues that are likely to face the state legislature in the state of Ohio more generally in the years ahead. The candidates have agreed to adhere to time limits on their answers so that we can cover a broad range of topics uh, during the hour. And each candidate will deliver at the end a brief closing statement. And um, you'll see, let me just explain what you might see too. You may see red folders sort of appearing in pictures as we go. That's our very low tech way of signaling to candidates that their time to answer questions is almost up. So uh, without further ado, let's turn to the candidates' opening statements of up to two minutes each. And first to speak is Ms. Sarah Carruthers. Thank you. Good evening. First, I'd like to thank the Menard Family Center for Democracy, the League of Women Voters of Oxford, and the Journal News for sponsoring this forum. I'm a lifelong resident of the city of Hamilton. I'm running again because I love this area, its people, and I've been an effective fighter for you in Columbus. I've always been devoted to giving back to my community in Butler County through numerous philanthropic events. I have a servant's heart and I put it to good use in Columbus. I want my two children to look around Butler County and be proud of their county and their state. As your state representative, I have fought for economic development, assuring that dollars come back to our community to repair infrastructure and rights for the most vulnerable among us, whether it's the elderly, children or animals. I'm making sure schools get funded and parents have the rights they should have. I'm proud of my work so far and the fact that most of my bills have been bipartisan. Still, I have much work to do and I wanna make sure you still have a strong voice in, in Ohio House. This is not a political stepping stone for me. This is my home and I'm doing the best I can for its people. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Lawrence. Uh, good evening. I'd also uh, first like to begin by thanking the Miami Menard Center for Democracy, the League of Women Voters of Oxford, and the Hamilton Journal News for sponsoring this event tonight. Uh, I also want to thank my opponent, Representative Carruthers, for accepting the invitation tonight. My name is Sam Lawrence. I'm running for state rep in the 47th district here because I believe our politics is focused around corruption and not common sense. A fundamental belief of mine is that civil servants should be just that, serving the folks who elected them. Our elected officials should work for the people and not for themselves. Columbus has been filled with this culture of corruption for longer than I've been alive, and I think it's time for a change. I'm a current student at Miami University, and I think I can bring a new and valuable perspective to the State House. Growing up, my parents taught me the values of transparency, integrity, and trust, traits that are sorely missed in the halls of the State House today. An example, two years ago, my opponent received $52,000 right after she proposed a $300 million handout to a special interest group. 
Folks like her who use their position of power for personal benefit, in my opinion, don't deserve to hold government office. I have nothing personal against her, but I'm running to provide a fresh new voice for the 47th district and clean out the corrupt establishment that's allowed Ohio to backslide for decades. Once again, my name is Sam Lawrence, and I look forward to answering your questions tonight. All right, thank you. Now we turn to our questions for the candidates, and we begin with a question to both candidates from Mike Pittman. All right, uh, welcome, and thank you very much for participating tonight. Um, now, you guys are going to be representing a newly drawn 47th House District. So how do you represent this district, given its diverse makeup of, among other things, a college town in Oxford, farming communities and multiple rural townships, and the home of the Butler County County seat? Um, first, Mr. Lawrence, two minutes. Yeah, I think that's a really important question. And I want to talk a little bit how I can adequately and not just adequately, but best represent uh, my constituents here in the 47th district. You're right, Mike, this is a really, really diverse district. We've got farmland, we've got uh, my home and Sarah's home, consequentially of Miami University, go Red Hawks. But uh, it takes a lot and it takes diverse experience to represent this kind of district. And I want to get out and head uh, out ahead of this. A lot of you watching at home know that I'm 19 years old. And some of you might be thinking, how can he run? He has no life experience. And I want to counter that question with a question. It's not no life experience. What do you think I've been doing over the past 19 years? I believe I have different life experience. Like I mentioned, uh, I, I have value as a student, someone who's worked minimum wage jobs and had to suffer uh, from the inflation and the rising prices that our constituents are, are suffering from right now. I believe I can relate to them in that way. Uh, and I also believe that I've been doing the work over the past 10 months running this campaign, getting out into every single corner of this district, Oxford, Hamilton, the township surrounding, knocking on every door we possibly can to talk to voters and see what they want, see what's important to them, not what I can do for my own political aspirations. That's why I'm running and that's why I think I can represent this district. Thank you very much. Uh, and if you at, at any time, if you need to question or repeat it, just ask and we will repeat. Um, Ms. Carruthers, two minutes. Same question. Well, Michael, I've lived here my whole life. Um, I actually grew up with my grandparents having a dairy farm. So I understand the farmers and the rural population. I worked out at the uh, Butler County Fair, have worked out there every single day for as long as I can remember. Um, I understand the farmers. I appreciate our farmers. So our rural district, I'm perfectly happy with. As far as uh, Miami University, I've worked with Miami University to help get the Elms underway and, and uh, some other things with uh, Senator Coley. Um, I think I have a very good grasp. You know, it, it, my opponent says that he's, he's lived here and he understands. He lives in a dorm room and he's lived here for a year and a half. I've lived here for 60 years. I think I have a pretty good grasp of the people around Butler County. Um, I remember, you know, we were the third house out in my neighborhood. So I pretty much know what's going on. I have seen this area alone in Hamilton go through the ups and downs and the revival that we're living through now. Um, I have... I have been working with many of the commit with all three of the commissioners since I was a young lady uh, in my teens. And um, so I, I think I actually know what needs to be done around the area better than most. All right, great. Thank you very much. I do have a follow up question that will go in the same order um, for answering it. Um, but the composition of the district may not last long given Ohio's controversial redistricting process and the likelihood that the legislative maps will most likely be drawn. Uh, so this might just be a one-term district here. Um, so with, with the Ohio Supreme Court ruled multiple times that they were unconstitutional, what would you say to voters who may be upset that we're even using these maps? Mr. Lawrence, two minutes. Funny thing about these virtual forums, I'm muted. I would say to voters that I feel the exact same anger that you do. Uh, we are using gerrymandered and unconstitutional maps. My, I think my opponent knows that. Uh, that's why the Ohio Supreme Court shot them down multiple times. And then we tried to hire an independent map making commission, something that I would strongly advocate for in the state house. And they shot those maps down too in, in, uh, in favor of their unfair ones. And back to the point of me living in a dorm, I actually have permanent residence here. I'm in a house currently, uh, my house. And I've lived in Butler County since I legally could. Uh, I chose this as my home. And like I said, I've been getting around the 
community for the past better part of a year and getting to know my constituents, actually doing the work of a campaign. But to your point, I think it's extremely, uh, extremely important that we really do talk about the issues that matter here, right? And so that's why uh, I am running in this home. This isn't a political stepping stone uh, for me. I love this community. They've welcomed me with open arms, and I'm really happy to be a resident here. Ms. Carruthers, two minutes. Did you repeat the question, Michael? Oh, no doubt, no doubt. Um, so the oh, I know. Oh, the, the About the 47th district. The composition, um, you know, as far as being gerrymandered, it, 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 you know, people like to live around people that have the same mindset. So no matter what they would have done, it would have been considered gerrymandered to anyone. However, they never asked any of the representatives what they would have chosen, which I find wrong. Um, because we do know our constituents better than anybody else. The governor will tell you the same thing. Um, we are always told we know our constituents better than anyone. So to not ask the representatives themselves and the senators themselves, I, I felt was very wrong. But you know, we didn't have a say in it. So it, it will go up to, I think to get somebody out of the loop is even worse, to be honest with you. They don't know anybody around here. So I think it's, it's fine the way it is right now. We'll go with it. Hopefully, they will um, they will have some some better ideas coming up, and we'll see what happens. I don't have a problem with my new district. I love I love Butler County. So no matter where you put me, I'm fine. Thank you very much. And for our next question, uh, Jennifer Fisher. Okay, great. Thank you. If historical patterns hold this year, the Republicans will have a supermajority in the Ohio House after November. And they could have a supermajority in the Senate as well. As one of 99 members of one half of the General Assembly, how will you make your voice be heard? Um, two minutes for each of you. First off, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, so I think that's an important question. And that's one especially my, my constituents ask of me. You know, it's, it's most likely that you will be elected into a super minority. And that's where I come in and say, uh, I've had no prior political experience. I have nobody I'm beholden to uh, that starts out with special interests, but also to lobbyists and, and other politicians who want uh, what they want done. Look, I'm coming in with a fresh perspective. I want to work with both Democrats, Republicans, and independents. I know we don't uh, have any independents currently in our legislature, but you best believe I'm going to be working across both sides of the aisle. Look, there are a lot of issues that we can take on in a bipartisan way through actionable, meaningful ways. Uh, I feel that partisanship has really, really descended from the federal level into the state level here. So many votes are partisan. Uh, I recognize that my opponent does have a bit of a bipartisan track record, and, and I would commend her for that. But essentially, uh, I want to do the same. I want to work with Democrats, Republicans, and independents to get things done. Okay, next up, Ms. Crothers. Uh, yes, well, honestly, I do have a great bipartisan record. Uh, most of my bills are bipartisan. And when I first entered the house, I was not beholden to anyone. I actually paid for my own campaign. I had a small group of volunteers and um, I worked my, took us off. Um, and no special interest groups had, were backing me whatsoever. So I went in there with eyes wide open. Um, and I learned a great deal. As far as bipartisan, we were told in the House that every priority bill was going to be a bipartisan bill. My House Bill 3, uh, which was a priority bill, was with Janine Boyd, and it remains. We are still working on that. It's in the Senate right now uh, for domestic violence, Aisha's law, uh, hoping it gets over the line now. Um, we were taught that every priority bill would be a priority bill, or every priority bill would be a bipartisan bill. And we learned to work together at that point. Nobody, when they went into the house, knew what the other person was in orientation. And I liked it that way. I really did. We all get along. We are not like Washington at all at the Ohio House. Now, there are a few that will only work on their side of the aisle. That's fine. I don't happen to be one of them because I don't think you get anything done. It's stagnant. Okay, thank you. All right, uh, we're now going to move into specific policy areas um, in a little more depth. 
And the, the next question pertains to the very contentious and difficult debate over abortion that's currently playing out across the nation in the wake of the Supreme Court's uh, Dobbs ruling. So given that the Ohio state legislature is very likely to address this issue over the next couple of years, please explain clearly what you think the law in Ohio ought to be or what it should be. Specifically, as a state legislator, will you support efforts to make abortion a crime in all circumstances or in no circumstances? Or if your position falls somewhere in between those two ends of the spectrum, please explain specifically what protections for abortion will you support if given the opportunity? Uh, and two minutes each, if we can. First, Ms. Carruthers. I figured you would go to me first. First of all, I don't think abortion is top of mind. Um, it is for the Democrats, of course. I am, I am really a supporter of birth control. I feel that there should, there really is not too many excuses right now for an unwanted pregnancy. We have over seven uh, different ways of birth control. And that isn't even thinking about the morning after pill. Now, you know, I think that there are other ways to look at this. I think we can also do a fully funded adoption service, um, lower cost for birth control. You know, we never seem to look at the answers. We always seem to look at abortion. I don't think that's what's on people's minds right now. I was reading a, an article from a woman in Virginia, an African-American woman who actually said, look, I get up in the morning, I have to feed my children, I clothe my children, I drive them to school, I drive myself to work and I come home and I'm back on that loop again. I don't get an abortion every way, every day. I do that every day. It's pocketbook issues. <clears throat> okay, let me, because this issue is, is, is important, polls are showing that it's important to... Um, it is important to Democrats. I don't, however, feel that it is important to the American people right now. Um, would you and and you can you can answer this or not? But would you? Are there any restrictions that, or are there any exceptions to a restriction? I think support? I think situations alter cases always. And as a woman, I think that most men should stay out of the topic. Okay, um, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, I hope everybody watching noticed how my opponent just straight up did not answer the question after asked twice. First of all. The overturning of Roe v. Wade was the biggest governmental overreach in my lifetime and in the lifetimes of many I know, uh, and, and it is unbelievable. I am endorsed by Planned Parenthood here in Ohio, and unfortunately, Sarah, facts don't care about your feelings. Polls do show that abortion is among the top issues of voters, not Republicans, not Democrats, but voters. You're wrong. Uh, so unfortunately, this is a top of mind issue and we have to talk about it. Look, there was a 10 year old girl that was raped here in the state of Ohio, and she had to travel to a different state to get an abortion. There are doctors all across the nation that are afraid to give their patients the health care. Notice how I said health care they need for ectopic pregnancies and other situations. So yes, it is an extremely situational issue. And I think we should solve it by talking about it. Uh, I think we should go back to Roe. I would work to codify Roe v. Wade uh, in this state. Uh, and I think it's unbelievable what's happening and how many will just distract from the question simply. May I address that 10 year old girl for one minute uh, or sure. less? All right, sure. let me address that. That man was illegal, number one. If, if our federal government had been doing their job, he wouldn't be here. Number two, Sam, I don't know how much you know about this issue, but he was the mother's boyfriend. If the mother had been doing her job as a parent, that wouldn't have happened. And number three, there are more issues on this than you probably know. Why didn't she do something about it and listen to her child? Mr. Mr. Response? Sure, absolutely. Yeah, uh, absolutely. I think, like you said, every every situation is different. But frankly, in this matter, uh, you're not the federal government. You you can't control oh, what thank the God. Government. You can't thank control God. the federal government. Can I speak? Thank you. You can't control when the federal government does their job. You can't control when a mom does her job. The only thing you control is this issue, and you still refuse to talk about it. It's insane. I'm not refusing to talk about it. I just answered it. What I'm saying is situations alter cases. And if you had read the heartbeat law, and if you had read these laws, look, it's a non-issue right now. It's in court. It is on hold. It's a non-issue to Ohioans right now. I'll let us move on. I would like that. Okay, um, the next question is Mike Pittman. 
All right. Um, Ms. Carruthers, you had recently introduced with Representative uh, Swearingen, yes. Swearingen, I think that's how you pronounce his yeah. name, um, the, the Parents' Bill of Rights Act, uh, which is similarly named to others around the country. Um, but you had, spec uh, in, in the journal news uh, story I wrote, you had told me that it's different in, in, in a lot of aspects. Can you talk about the similarities and differences this bill has with those other bills and Absolutely. why this was needed? Absolutely. Thank you, Michael. Actually, it's, it's similar in that we are allowing, I mean, we have no problem with um, appropriate, for age appropriate students. The other bills were very drastic. And DJ, Rep Swearingen and I are not drastic people. This is age appropriate um, health. We're fine with that, all of that. Um, usually you get your health classes in fifth grade. That's when most children go through theirs. That's fine. Um, I know with my children's school, you get a handout saying you can watch the video beforehand, whatever, um, all of those things. Sam's nodding, which shows me that his school did, but you went to private school, didn't you, Sam? I went to both. Well, I went to public school all my life. My children go to private. So you get a handout saying that you may view this beforehand and sign off. That's all we're asking for that. We're not asking for great drastic thing. This was not trying to hurt anyone. All it's asking is that the schools and the parents work hand in hand. The parents aren't really being told what's going on in a lot of schools right now all over Ohio. In Hamilton, I can't say that's true. I can't say that's true in a lot of Butler County schools, but I can say throughout Ohio it is happening and it's a concern to these parents and they're reaching out concerned. So what this does is give them guidelines. And I've been told by a couple of schools that it actually helps them because the, the counselors don't really know what they can share with parents. And that's a concern to them. So hopefully this will open the door. We need to focus. If you look at the scores around the country and in Ohio, our scores are falling on reading and arithmetic. We've got to do something. We have to focus on this. And the mental health of our children is so horrible right now. We have to focus. We're giving kids problems that are adult issues and laying it off on kids. Let's let kids be kids for a while. Sorry. Thank you, uh, Ms. Carruthers. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, um, slightly altered question of the same topic. I just wanted to get your thoughts on this bill. And what, are, are there any changes or compromises, if any, would you like to see with this legislation or just what, what are your thoughts? Well, first of all, uh, let me start off by saying I think it, it's a good idea involving our, our parents and our students' education, I'll, although I, I will say I think it goes too far. Um, I, again, as someone who just went through high school, I had a lot of friends. I, I knew people who would go to their school counselors or their teachers or their faculty and staff to talk about things, maybe even problems at home. Uh, this bill could create a problem for those children with problems at home who bring it to school because that's the only safe place they have to go. They only trust people there. Uh, otherwise, I think it's I think it's a good idea to involve our parents in, in the education system, although uh, I wouldn't uh, I wouldn't distract against we should be involving our teachers more in our education system who knows better our education system what to teach and how to teach it than our teachers you have one party who is trying to ban books and whitewash history uh, and and make up problems that are not really happening in the classroom uh, and you have one party who is trying to adequately fund public education uh, and make it a safe space for our children I do have a follow-up here um so Ms. Carruthers you had said um that you're not banning any age appropriate content no, age appropriate content, but, is not yes. banning books yeah yes. but but um is, is this bill could this bill be misinterpreted in any way and and why not if if not well they already are misinterpreting it as a slam to the lgbtq i have never slammed lgbtq in my life um although i get accused of that i you know I have never voted against anything for gay marriage or anything else. I have too many gay friends. Um, I truly don't understand the, the idea except that they're reading other things into this. Uh, I don't believe in banning books. That sounds very puritanical to me, so I don't know. Um, they're looking across the country and reading those other bills, I would say. Uh, Mr. Lawrence, um, just again, a little bit different spin since you're in a different position here. 
but how do you make sure that there's transparent conversations between schools and teachers and parents? Um, you said that teachers need to be more involved. So, but how do you get, how do you make that happen? Well, first of all, there are a multitude of different ways at each different school level and each in each different school system uh, that both parents and teachers can have the advocacy they want. Uh, because I believe at the end of the day, we all want what's best for our children. We all want the best education. We have just we just have different ways going about it. And to go back uh, to what Sarah said just a second there, she said, I've never done anything against the LGBTQ community. Well, Sarah, I'll point out that the T in that acronym stands for transgender. You voted for internal genital examinations of our trans athletes at the high school level. That's disgusting, frankly. It is nothing short of disgusting. And as far as education goes, uh, I, I believe that we should involve both teachers uh, and parents, whether that be a, a PTO, board meetings, that sort of thing. Sarah, would you like about 15 seconds to for that uh, last? Yes, one? what I voted against was women competing against trans, young ladies uh, competing against trans. There was no mention of that in that bill, and it went. It, it was going to the Senate. The Senate was going. To, I was going to work with them to take that out in the Senate. That's the thing that having someone that's young and naive doesn't understand is those bills are tweaked the entire time. They go from the committee to the floor to the Senate and back. They are constantly being worked on. Sam, would you like to, a quick rebuttal? Yes, I would. Uh, my opponent said that it wasn't in the bill when she voted for it, but then it went to the Senate. She was going to work to try to take it out. I don't really understand that. And forgive me, I've never been a representative. I don't understand the legislative processes. You're right. I I, uh, I believe that you were probably in a similar situation when you were first starting at the state house. but I'm ready to learn. Honestly, I am. So um, you can run circles around me with, with legislative uh, agendas and how you go about your day at the state house. But at the end of the day, it's the issue we're talking about. And yes, uh, you voted for what you said, but you also voted for uh, internal intrusions into our trans children's lives. All right, I think we need to move on here. I, uh, uh, Jenny Fisher, uh, you have the next question. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, does the state have a responsibility to address climate change? Should the state assist in the transition to alternative energy? If so, how? Um, two minutes for both of you. Um, Mr. Lawrence, you start first. Yeah, absolutely. I believe the, the state should be responsible for a transition to clean energy dealing with climate change. I think this is another one of the benefits my, my age does give me and the fact that I was raised, I grew up on the solid science. Uh, my generation knows what's going on. We know climate change is real. The earth is warming. Humans have a lot to do with it. And we're ready to start fighting it. Uh, not to mention that this issue is going to fall to my generation next. We're going to be the ones that have to deal with this. That's why I'm so proud of all the activists, all the politicians, all those running for office in my generation who are uh, who are campaigning on clean energy uh, and climate change. But we can start doing that by repealing the other side of House Bill 6. Currently, uh, House Bill 6 was the biggest corruption scandal in state history. And uh, currently, Ohioans are still paying a corruption tax on their energy bill. Almost $300,000 every single day goes to two coal plants here in the state of Ohio. We can't afford to be doing that. We need to transition to nuclear, to wind, to solar, to hydro. I'm all for it. Uh, and I look forward to working with all of our different communities to see how we can go about doing that. Um, can I, before we move to Ms. Crothers, can I get a more specific on how uh, we should be transitioning <laughs> to uh, alternatives, please? Yeah, absolutely. That starts with creating good paying jobs uh, with manufacturing here in the state of Ohio, not only good paying, but green jobs. That also starts with giving small businesses tax incentives. That's something the state of Ohio can do. If small businesses are employing environmentally friendly work practices, we can give them a tax incentive because that lifts the burden off their back, allows them to grow more and also does good for our state, our nation and the world. Okay, thank you. Um, the same question for Ms. Crothers. Two minutes, please. Uh, we're doing more than ever in Hamilton. I'm sure Sam knows because he's been all over around here that he knows that Hamilton is using the cleanest energy that we have our own utility group here in Hamilton. Um, we run on hydro, which is the cleanest energy. Did you know that, Sam? And Hamilton and the surrounding areas serve our citizens with central-based traffic signs, making it easier and faster, fiber broadband, 
um, new billing areas, and we're putting in three charge point chargers around the area. Um, as far as um, as far as House Bill Six, I'm going to touch on that because I knew he was going to. Um, this wasn't like bailing out a Ford or a bank. This was a utility, and when if you look at the website, and I'm going to give you the website. Uh, PJM.com, it is vital. It was nuclear energy, which by the way, is one of the cleanest energies. It was saving lives actually, because it was a clean energy. And if you look at PJM at any point in the day, you will see that we are not ready to move completely into solar or wind. Um, we in Hamilton have our own utilities, as I said, and it's clean. I would also like to uh, point out, it cut people's costs. And they are now seeing those costs in their bills. Sam, the whole thing about the coal is bogus. It did not take place. Um, actually, if you look at um, if you look at that website, you will see Hamilton is our Ohio is very blessed to have two nuclear plants. And these these jobs were not actually going to be able to be filled by Joe Blow Ordinary. These were nuclear physicists, and those areas were very uh, thrilled that we saved those plants. We use so much nuclear and so much um, gas. There is, there is nothing else like that. Uh, Hamilton is very blessed to have hydro also. So it, it has nothing to do with that. House Bill 6 was a terribly necessary thing. So OK, great. Thank you. Um, can I just get a quick yes or no, um, Ms. Crothers? Um, do you believe that there should be state legislation to help address um, climate change? There is, there is, there has been, and there is. We're continually working on it. Okay, great. Thank Otherwise you. there wouldn't have been a House Bill 6. Okay, great. Good point. Uh, thank you, we're gonna move on uh, to... Um... All right, thanks. Um, I'd like to turn us to the question of firearms regulation in the state. Um, first, do you believe that, do you believe um, that the Second Amendment protects the right of an individual to own a firearm? And related to that, uh, what, if any, restrictions on firearms would you be willing to support in state law? Uh, for instance, would you support mandatory background checks? Would you support uh, waiting periods? Would you support additional restrictions on the types or amounts of ammunition or, or weapons that are, are sold in the state? Uh, just please be specific in your in your position of what you think the state, if anything, the state ought to do uh, to to regulate guns. And um, I think in the rotation, I believe Ms. Carruthers is first on this. Uh, two minutes, please. Well, I've always been a strong supporter of Second Amendment rights. I think um, Senator Dolan has a piece, a bill right now regarding gun legislation. I would have to look at that more closely. Um, I believe it has a couple of um, caveats for um, a, a uh, wait time and some things like that. It is sort of a red flag law. I don't know. Uh, but I would like to look at that and see what he has to say. But I believe in the Second Amendment right. I've always been a strong proponent for that. My father was a gunnery sergeant. I have my CCW. And uh, it depends on law enforcement, quite frankly. I go with the law enforcement. All right, thank you, Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, absolutely. I think, uh, first of all, I am a supporter of the Second Amendment. I do believe it protects an individual's right to own a firearm. But I also think we have to look at the issue that is a uniquely American issue of gun violence, right? We have more shootings and more mass shootings than any other country on this earth uh, combined per year, right? And this is, we are not strangers to this. I grew up in an era having more school shootings than fire drills. That's just the reality of it. It's dark and it's sad. Uh, so a few things the state can do uh, to ensure that this does not go on. Universal background checks, uh, safe storage laws, red flag laws, waiting periods. These are four things that are overwhelmingly supported by not just a majority of Ohioans, but a majority of gun owners here in the state of Ohio. Yet because some of our representatives are, um, are counting on other people uh, for their votes, we can't get it done. These are four actionable things, meaningful things that I think I could get bipartisan support on. I look forward to working on those four things. Uh, and also with regard to the police, I'm an, avid, I'm an avid supporter of our police and police funding. 
I don't know how my opponent can say the same. She voted for constitutional carry, the, fr uh, the Fraternal Order of Police of Ohio, railed against that bill, railed against that bill, uh, where in not, not only being able to constitutional carry without any training, without a background check, uh, you don't even have to alert an officer anymore unless you're asked that you're constitutional carrying. That's why the Fraternal Order of Police was advocating against, against that bill. You also voted for House Bill 99, Sarah, arming teachers in our schools. And not only that, but lowering the requirement to arm teachers in our schools. The FOP also railed against that. You're not voting with the police. I will. Uh, Ms. Crothers, would you like to respond or or? I, I do vote with the police. I do agree that uh, House Bill 99, uh, it took a lot to vote for that. However, I, I look at Texas and if somebody had had a gun in that school, I think a lot would have changed. Good. Mr. Lawrence, any follow up or? Yeah, uh, I was always taught, again, like I said, I went through a lot of school shooting drills and the number one thing we were always taught, because again, this was an existential threat when I was in school. Uh, was that if if you get a shooter down and he does not have a gun anymore, turn over a trash can and put it over a gun. Because when the police go into the building, they are going to shoot the first person with a gun. More guns is simply not the answers. Look, you can keep your pistols, you can keep your rifles, you can keep your shotguns, but we can take common sense, actionable action to fight this. All right, thank you. Uh, next question is Mike Pittman. All right, thank you very much. Um... Going, we talked a little bit about partisanship earlier, but I mean, overall, part bipartisanship has seemed to be a lost art in uh, politics today. Um, but we have seen uh, some actions where Republicans and Democrats have worked together. Sarah, you had cited with Aisha's law. I've reported on that, where uh, it does help define, expand the definition of domestic violence and other things. But Mr. Lawrence wanted to uh, to ask you this first. If elected and being new in the General Assembly, how do you work with your Republican counterparts? And also, more importantly, how do you differ from other Democrats? Two minutes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so first of all, how I'm going to work with my Republican counterparts is the same way I mentioned earlier, which is explaining to them, making personal relationships, first of all. Uh, I know we are on both you know, different sides of the spectrum, but at the end of the day, um, we all claim at least that we want to help our constituents as, as most as possible. And I think that is what should should uh, light the fire under our butts for, for really getting legislation through. I believe that's the same for Republicans and Democrats. There are plenty of actionable issues uh, we can do that with. But I'm not your average Democrat because uh, I, I don't stand with my party on some issues. Some fringe members of my party are calling to defund the police. I disagree with them. I, I think we should fund the police. We should reallocate funds to different programs for bias training and, and other things like that. But generally, uh, obviously, I haven't had the chance to vote on any bills yet. But if I did, um, I want people to know I'm not going to be straying the party line on every single bill. I will vote my conscience and I will vote what I think is best for the 47th district. Right. Ms. Carruthers, a little different version of this question, but uh, there, there are a lot of party line votes in, in the House as well as the Senate. Can you talk about the other ways you've reached across the aisle and also in what ways have you differed from the Republican poly Party? Well, I think, to be honest with you, it, it is interesting because we if you talk to even my children, you'll find that uh, we are not like Washington at all. If you tune in to... Um, ohiohouse.gov and watch. We actually all get along very well off offline. And actually, even in session, most of the time, we all are friends. Uh, we talk about our families and everything else. And we are all there. I can't honestly say that there's anybody there that isn't trying to do the best for their constituents and their state. Uh, there is a true love of where they come from and what they're working toward. And I am certainly part of that. Um, we, I don't do any, you know, fast food legislation. I'm very slow going on my legislation because I want it to be the best. And I reach out to other parties to discuss what do you think would help this? What would make it more palatable to your party? Um, that's something very important to me. I have two girlfriends, unfortunately, both leaving the house this year that I really care about on the Democratic Party. And um, we talk often and discuss what would help, you know, what would help them to come to, to a, a viable solution on things. So 
I think really it's always in the works at the House. You just don't see it because people are so tuned into Washington and watching the hate going on. You know, when I was growing up, and I think when some of you were growing up, we got our news from Walter Cronkite and, and things like that. I mean, I read Newsweek and Time and and three newspapers a day when I was Sam's age, and they were not biased. They weren't paid for by, and I, I'm, no, I'm not bashing, you know that, Michael. Um, but they weren't paid for by big corporations and people free thought. They had free thinking. They didn't go on Twitter and they didn't go on TikTok. They didn't get snippets of news. They, they were, sorry, they were allowed to think for themselves. And I miss those days. I really do. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, our next question uh, is from Jenny Fisher. Okay, great. Thank you. Um, according to coverage in the Ohio Capitol Journal and, and the Journal News, Ms. Crothers proposed legislation in October 2021 allocating $300 million in bailouts to private nursing homes. Yes. Within a month, Ms. Crothers received four campaign contributions, each one of 13200 The donors were all connected to the nursing home industry. The proposed legislation, House Bill 461, did not pass. However, the idea was folded into a separate appropriations bill that handed out a total of four, four billion uh, in federal pandemic relief funds to schools, childcare, and others. Um, the question for Ms. Crothers, do you believe voters should be concerned about this? Uh, two minutes. Absolutely not. Look, I've worked in and around nursing homes since I was a teenager. I would decorate Westover for Christmas with my mother who was on the guild there. As I grew older, I worked the holidays and sing-alongs with Dave Ballou. People always were reached through music during that, especially the aging population. Then I would go and feed my grandmother. I took care of both of my aging parents until their death. Um, I would take my, um, my children, my cousin started the prep school at Westover and my children went to Westover prep school. I'm very proud of Community First and all it's done and Berkeley Square, which has my family's entire history on their names. Uh, an entire wing was named after my family and members of my family. My whole family understands care for the aging. Naturally, those groups know me. Obviously, they know me. They have asked me for money many times. I can't think of many groups around Hamilton and the surrounding areas that haven't asked me for money. So why not would they look at me and say, hey, she's doing something to support us. Why wouldn't we support them? I mean, that makes perfect sense to me. And let me also state that during that period of time, it was looked into by Rep Crossman and nothing was found. As Michael wrote so eloquently, I turned in all of my texts. You know, the minute you go in there, you're, you do not have privacy on your phone or your calendar or anything else. I turned in every single bit of information. Nothing was found, nothing added up. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this is on the same topic um, for Mr. Lawrence. Um, during the pandemic, Many nursing homes did fall on hard times as their COVID related precautions increased and many low wage health workers walked away from their positions. Ohio's Appropriation Act allocated 11 million to nursing homes and long term care strike teams. The act included a provision to ensure that the funds were, were for direct care staff compensation and prohibited the distribution of funds to facility administrators or facility owners. Do you believe that the allocation of federal pandemic relief funds to nursing homes was appropriate um, and at this level? Two minutes, please. Truth be told, Jennifer, I don't know because there's not any public information out there. The first time I'd ever heard of an investigation, our team and the public was in today's story that Sarah just mentioned. And you talked about Rep Crossman. I was talking to Rep Crossman just a few weeks ago, just a few weeks ago, and he said uh, that it should be investigated. Look, I want to tell you all a story and I want to get into this, right? Sarah proposed a $300 million bailout to the nursing home industry. And don't get me wrong, especially during the height of COVID, I think it's great to fund our nursing home industries, our elder care. I'm all for it. 
But just like the House Bill 6 scandal, where she looked at the side of the policy, she didn't look at the corruption side. And House Bill 6, $61 million went to Larry Householder for his reelection campaign, among millions of other dollars to other Republicans. In this, just a week after this was passed, you got paid maximum contributions totaling $52,000 from the CEO of the biggest nursing chain in Ohio, his wife, his lawyer, uh, and his business partner. That is unacceptable in my eyes. And look, there's no public information. I don't know if it was ethical or not. I would like to know. Uh, another thing I'll point out, we can't keep having our politicians and our elected officials be bankrolled by people uh, who, who can give a 626 average dollar donation. This cycle, my opponent has had 47 contributions with a 626 dollar average contribution. Who do you think is funding those campaigns? We've had over 2,500 individual contributions from around the state and around the country with a $31 average. I'm funded by working people. We are creating a grassroots movement to kick out this type of corruption we're talking about. Okay, great. Thank you. Let's move on. All oh, right, wait. thanks. Now, wait a minute. No, it wasn't a bailout. We lost workers. We lost everything because we were bit. No, Jennifer, I'm sorry. Okay, go ahead. One minute. Lost workers. We lost workers. We lost everything during the pandemic. We are still losing workers. Everybody would rather work at Amazon than they would clean up grandma. I bet you would too. Now, the fact of the matter is there was no bailout. And as far as looking into House Bill 6, I wasn't even on the committee, Sam. So when you cast aspersions about this, honey, you don't understand. If you're not on that committee, you don't know. And you know what? I, there still is no proof of any of that. He hasn't had his day in court. The thing about the bill for the nursing homes is that they had to pay for all of the products that were coming through there. The pandemic riddled the whole nursing home industry. Now, it didn't even go through. And as far as Crossman saying that, that's because he wants to be AG. Let's get down to facts here. Uh, th 30 oh. seconds, Sam. Yeah, um, I just want to reiterate, I'm not against funding nursing homes at all. Uh, in fact, I probably would have been in favor of such a thing had I been uh, in, in the legislature at the time. And also, Sarah, I never said you were on the committee. I never said that. But you did vote not to expel the guy that was behind all of it. And you were in the minority of that. Yes, because I believe you're innocent until proven guilty. Are you not, Sam, innocent until proven guilty, honey? I believe that you are. But seeing there as the you house... Go. That's how it works in America. We can move and it on. hasn't had a day in court. That's, I mean, that's just the way it works here. And his constituents still, they didn't have a representative. They voted for him knowing full well what was going on. As a matter of fact, during that whole householder thing, we held up the rules. The first vote was to spend the rules, to suspend the rules. Do you know what that means? Ignore the rules. Now, I believe in rules. Okay. I'm we, getting we, need, we, we, we really do need to move on because okay. we're running out of time. Um, and my, my question is actually about uh, higher ed because this the, the new 47th district is home to one of the state's largest public universities. So, yeah. uh, and this is really just a general question. Um, the lots of families in Ohio are, are struggling to pay for, for not only college, but also for, for other forms of post secondary education and training. So as a state legislator, what do you intend to do to address those concerns, to, to make it easier for families to make post-secondary education more accessible and affordable to Ohioans? And um, I don't know which person should go first at this point. I've lost track. So let me just- I can't remember uh, either. Uh, well, let, let's, let's go with- I think Jennifer would love it if Sam did. Well, go ahead, Mr. Lawrence. Um, okay. <laughs> as uh, as a state representative, I would ensure that the, co uh, the cost of higher education goes down. It's that simple. Look, uh, college is becoming less and less affordable while people aren't making enough to keep up with it. Look, I'm very thankful to go to college right now. I know uh, Sarah and I probably don't agree on a lot of things, but we ought to agree on our love for, for Miami. Uh, love and honor, Sarah, to you. But uh, first of all, things like Pell Grants, things like OCOD Grants, making those more accessible, uh, like I said, bringing down the cost of higher ed and working with each individual college in our state to ensure that they can create 
uh, and diversified programs that will bring in new students, students from generations. They might be a first generation college student. They might have not have any ancestors who have gone to college. This is a great thing we have going. Uh, I think I bring a unique perspective as a current student at Miami University. I'm talking to a lot of professors here and faculty and staff, and they're telling me all of the things they wish they would do differently with our education system. Uh, and I'm excited to get started. Let me let me ask you to be more specific with that. So you, you mentioned Pell Grants. Those, of course, are federal. Um, are there specific things that the state government should be doing? Uh, what for, Like for I mentioned. Go ahead. Thank you. Like I mentioned, we talked a lot about OCOG grants. I was actually part of an advocacy group that went to the state house here at Miami, and that's all we were talking about. It wasn't partisan. We were meeting with all our representatives and our senators, and we were talking about what we could better do. I think OCOG grants is an absolutely great uh, great idea there. We've got it going well. Uh, and again, just expanding those programs, making sure everyone who can go to college uh, can go to college does. Uh, but also ensuring that our, our students know college isn't the only way they can go. We need to be uh, creating more valuable and better routes into the trades and into other lines of work where you might not necessarily have to go to college. All right. Thank you, Ms. Carruthers. Yes. Well, actually, this has been something that I've worked on since one since I first arrived at the House and prior. I worked with Senator Coley on the Job to Work program, which actually put students um, in the Job to Work program uh, at Thilstein Krupp, um, and they work. Different companies have bought into this, and what happens is the students can go to Miami. The jobs, and he got this from uh, UPS. Actually, it was something that we stole from another group, another state. Uh, I'm sure you're familiar with it, but what happens is they go to work and the business actually pays for the schooling and the students work and go to school and they can move up in the company. They, it's, it's been a tremendous success. Um, and they also can keep working if they choose to or just graduate and leave, but it also gives them a pension later on and some things like that. Some people have found just wonderful success with it. So a lot of companies here in Hamilton are working with it all over Butler County. All right, thank you, Mike. All right, thank you very much. Um, it has been uh, an exciting uh, debate so far. <laughs> so at the worst of the uh, COVID-19, or as the worst of the COVID-19 pandemic has, knock on wood, passed, uh, the coronavirus is still with us and is going to be likely with us for the foreseeable future. With that in mind, could you talk about what lessons we should draw from how the state has handled this uh, pandemic and is currently handling? Uh, Sarah, two minutes. I think we, I think needless to say, everybody made some mistakes. I think we had some wins and we had some losses, um, just like everybody else. I don't think that... Um, we really, we really handled the nursing home situation well, but I don't think there was a way of handling that very well, unfortunately. Um, we actually are still working on legislation to make it easier for them, not necessarily finances, but letting people see their family members um, in, a, in an area. Uh, that was the most heart-wrenching for me, sitting on that committee and hearing people that lost their loved ones. But I think we're better equipped now and we're on the right track um, to handle things like this. I'd like to see more. Uh, I don't foresee another event like this in the near future. God, I hope not for all of us. But I, I think like anybody else, you know, this was new to us. And, and I think we all handled it as best we can. Now we just don't need to regroup. All right, Sam, two minutes, same question. If you need me to repeat it, just let me know. No, uh, yeah, I, I agree with Sarah. I think we had some wins, had some losses. Overall, I think Governor DeWine did a great job with his COVID response, whether it was the hiring of some staffers in his administration, whether it was the daily press conferences. Uh, Ohio got through it better than a lot of other states. But I think what we learned is we need to trust the science and we need to trust the experts. Um, uh, you know, there were so many Republicans, uh, and I'm not talking about you, Sarah, don't worry. Um, there were so many Republicans that were spouting anti-vax disinformation and talking about so many of our, our officials in power, like Dr. Amy Acton, like Dr. Anthony Fauci, that were doing the best they could to help us navigate this once in a lifetime pandemic. And Sarah, I hope you're right. Uh, I hope we don't have another one. That was pretty stressful for all of us. We had to get used to Zoom, get used to not seeing our friends. But absolutely, I think the number one lesson we learned 
uh, is that we have to trust the science. We have to trust the experts. I think as a country, our reaction was uh, majorly delayed. I think we could have done much more in terms of masks, in terms of public rhetoric, and in terms of things like ventilators uh, and hospital beds prior to the pandemic hitting. Just a quick follow-up. Um, first, uh, Ms. Carruthers, then Mr. Lawrence, uh, what changes in state law might be called for um, so that we can be prepared uh, in case there is another pandemic or something like that in the future? God forbid that that doesn't happen. Well, I don't think we need to shut down everything like we did for one. I mean, that that killed our economy. It, it really killed small business. And I'm a huge proponent of small business, as you know. So um, I, I think that was something we really didn't see. I thought it was interesting that Pfizer now has come out to say that it, it really didn't, uh, the vaccine didn't stop the spread. That was interesting the other day. Um, I, I think, you know, we have to, to weigh our economy first and see what we needed to do. Uh, we put up some, some ridiculous things, even at the state house, plastic things that were of absolutely no use and spent money on ridiculous things. So I, I think um, it was a matter of educating people and we, we tried to do that. That I thought was good, but some of the expense was ridiculous. But is there any specific? There is. I don't think that. Yeah, we've had legislation in the past, but to be honest with you, I can't call upon it right now because it's sort of in the background right now to me because it's it's a a dead topic sort of. Uh, but there was legislation so that we couldn't have one person say, "Okay, we got to end everything. We got to shut everything down," which was good. We can't have just one person be the end all be all on everything. You have to have a group. All right, Mr. Lawrence? Yeah, I agree partially. Um, first of all, uh, Sarah mentioned that she would uh, look at our economy first. With a public health issue, I'm going to choose to look at public health first. I think that's the best way to go. Again, trusting our doctors, trusting our sciences. Um, I think we did it the best way we possibly could. And again, I have to com commend Governor DeWine. We shut it down when we needed to to save lives. Uh, we we uh, used things like plastic barriers that actually do slow the spread. And really, uh, plastic barriers and masks had no huge effect on the daily lives of a lot of people. So it's it's scary to see so many people railing against it. But overall, um, I believe the lives of our citizens should come first, and then we can talk about the economy. All right, I think we'll move on to the next question. Uh, Ms. Fisher? Okay, great. Thank you. Uh, Ms. Crothers co-sponsored House Bill 327, the Div Divisive Concepts Bill in 2021. HB 327 applies to school districts, state agencies, and state colleges. It would ban teaching such concepts as the United States is fundamentally racist or sexist, and an individual by virtue of the individual's nationality, color, ethnicity, race, or sex, bears responsibility for actions committed in the past by other members of the same nationality, color, ethnicity, race, or sex. Under it, schools could have lost partial or even complete state funding if found to be in violation. Teachers could have lost their licenses. What would you say to those who found the bill to be extreme in the punishments and vague about what exactly was prohibited? Um, could it hinder the ability of teachers and students to fully engage in an examination of history and current events. Um, in addition to impacting our local school districts, Miami University is a state college located within the newly created District 47. Um, for Ms. Crothers, um, would this type of legislation amount to government overreach? Two minutes. Glad you brought this up. This is a bill from Sarah Fowler, correct? And I co-sponsored, did not sponsor. You were, I'm, I'm sorry, that you were a co-sponsor. Yeah, I did not sponsor this bill. This no. was brought up by Diane Grendel and then Sarah Fowler, Arthur Fowler brought it up. Um, this bill has been in the constant works. Um, we are still working on this bill. It is a very difficult bill. Uh, it is known as the CRT bill, I believe. And, um, I have been gently, um, you know, it's easier to work with someone when you're friendly with them and when you get to know them. There are many aspects of this bill that I feel 
will be changed in committee and need to be changed. This bill has already been changed a great deal. And I do feel that there are a number of aspects that need to be worked on and amended in different areas. Um, it has been said that Ms. Fowler misspoke, or Representative Fowler misspoke about the Holocaust. I believe she totally misspoke about the Holocaust. It is not how Sarah feels at all, number one. Um, and anyone who knows me personally knows that the Jewish faith is terribly important to me for my own reasons. So um, it is one of those things where it's better to co-sponsor and be able to help from near than it is to not and work on the um, friendship basis and get things amended. You know, nobody really does wanna see how the sausage is made. You've heard that saying, you wanna be in the room where it happened. And it's a little bit better to work with the sponsors and discuss things as a friend. Okay, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. um, a little bit different question for Mr. Lawrence on the same topic though. What is the role of the state in ensuring that Ohio students get a strong education? Do you believe that bias is present in the schools? If, if so, how should it be addressed? Two minutes. I believe there's always going to be a bit of bias taught with any uh, subject, but I also believe we have to look at the facts here and the facts are, Critical race theory isn't taught until you get to college here in the state of Ohio. My, I know that. I'm a current college student. Uh, my college peers know that, and people in high school know that because they're not being taught it. Uh, this bill is addressing issues that are being made up. And as for the Holocaust, it does uh, blur the lines in, in between those choppy waters of things like the Holocaust, which I am not, uh, I'm not afraid to say was objectively horrible. I don't think teachers should be afraid to say that either. Uh, I think this is another instance where we should be listening to the advocacy of teachers uh, who are railing against this bill uh, and, and not take word from representatives who aren't in the classroom. Okay, great, thank you. Um, we will move on to um, closing and I'll let John, I'm sorry, Mr. Foran. Okay, well, um, actually I want to shoehorn in a last question if I may. Yeah. Um, so, and then it's, um, it's really more generally about the political environment. And it seems like a nice way to sort of close this, this discussion because we're in a political environment right now uh, in which lots of Americans are skeptical about our elections, about their reliability, about the fairness of our elections. So in that context, I, I really have three related questions. Um, first, what what would each of you say to, to people who may be saying to themselves, I'm just not going to bother to vote uh, this time around? Why? What would you say to them? Why should they vote? That's one question. Um, secondly, um, a question that, that we didn't used to ask in forums like this, but I will now. If Do you personally pledge to accept the certified results of the election, um, regardless of the outcome? And if you're not the certified winner, will you concede? And and finally, more generally, what would you say to your fellow Ohioans who think that uh, elections are are in, at risk of being stolen or that, that we can't trust our electoral process? And um, uh, I wish I kept track of who's supposed to go first. So let's say Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, thank you for the question, John. I think that's super important. I think people are focused on our democracy right now after January 6th, just as much as we ever been. And the truth is our democracy is hanging by a thread. That's part of the reason I'm running. Uh, I think people think our two sides are, are more polarized than they ever have been. I believe that's true. I think that's a product of the rhetoric and the dis and misinformation that's flowing through all of our channels. Uh, but first of all, yes, absolutely. People who are sitting at home right now watching me and, and Sarah duke it out and, and saying, why is it important that I vote? I don't really care. These issues aren't going to affect me. I think this is another thing that Representative Carruthers and I can agree on. Whether you are a Republican, a Democrat, or an independent, it is absolutely essential to use your civic duty and go vote. Uh, these elections, we had 18 elections in the state of Ohio that were tied last year and that were decided by a coin flip. That doesn't seem right to me. Uh, our democracy, as you get lower from federal to state to local elections, your vote means more. Uh, second of all, yes, I do accept to pledge the results of this election, whether I win or whether I lose, I will concede. If I do lose, I hope Sarah will do the same. 
Um, but honestly, I, I really think we need to take a look at some in the Republican Party who have been saying that the 2020 election was fraudulent. They've done audits. They've done studies. There has been not a shred of evidence or proof of that. And frankly, we can't just say an election was stolen anytime we don't like the results. I pledge to accept this safe and secure election, uh, whether I win or lose. And thank you. All right. Thanks, Ms. Carellers. Uh, I, we can agree that it is your civic duty to vote. It's always been something very important to me since I was 18. Um, I, I hate the political climate right now. I mean, listening to Sam's rhetoric about me online has been just horrible. I can't even imagine talking about someone, especially older and a female, the way he's talked about me. I think it's just disgusting. Um, of course, I would accept whatever happens in an election. That's just that's beyond me. I've never understood that. I could not understand it with Hillary Clinton. I don't get it. Um, and as far as Ohio, I don't know about other states and their elections. I know about Ohio. Diane Noonan, who has been in charge of the Board of Elections until recently, and I think you all know her, I trust her emphatically. I know Ohio's and Butler County's elections have been run smoothly, and I trust uh, Frank LaRose, and they have been clean elections. So I can't balk at anything. All right, thank you. And and on that note, we'll move now to closing statements from each of the candidates, uh, going in reverse order from the opening statements. So uh, we'll turn first to Mr. Lawrence. Yeah, uh, thank you guys for moderating this again, Sarah. I would also like to thank you again for doing this. This was fun. Um, I decided to run for state rep to bring about a new vision for Ohio and provide a fresh voice for our families, our workers, and our students. I think my generation has been left behind by this corrupt establishment and the out-of-touch extremist legislators in Columbus like my opponent. Uh, I want to bring a perspective to our politics that makes government work for the people. We're running this campaign on the idea that government should do just that, work for the people and not those in power. Uh, tonight, I believe I proved that I'll legislate based on the needs and the concerns of the 47th district, and I would love your vote on November 8th. For more info about me, my platform, how I grew up, I'd love for you to visit samforohio.com or follow us on all social medias at Sam for Ohio. I look forward to working with the people of District 47 in Columbus, and I can't wait to bring honesty, transparency, and integrity back to the State House. Once again, my name is Sam Lawrence. If you're in Oxford, Hamilton, Riley Township, Oxford Township, Fairfield Township, or Hanover Township, I would love your vote this November. Thank you. All right, thanks, Ms. Carruthers. Thank you again for this forum. I'm proud to be your state representative. I've spent my whole life serving my community, and I know that there are no limits to what we can accomplish if government gets out of the way. I'm not your typical elected official. I didn't choose to get into this. My children chose that I should. I truly care about the people here, and I've shown it throughout my life. As a mother of two wonderful children, I will champion the rights of the unborn, I will stand firm in protecting our Second Amendment rights, and I will strive to lower taxes. Our people are hurting right now with out of control inflation, crime on the rise, and our borders are wide open with allowing fentanyl to come in and kill so many. We're dealing with so many problems being pushed on us from failed leadership at the federal level. But I know that the leadership here in Ohio is on a good footing now, and I'm proud to be a part of it. I've been proud to bring back to Butler County over 40 million of your tax dollars to do good work that we've needed in our area. And I hope to do so much more. Thank you so much for having me. And I really appreciate it. And those who wanna get in touch with me, you know, you can always reach me here in Hamilton. I've been around, people have seen me, I've been all over. And you also can reach me at my office, thank you. All right, thank you. With that, we'll bring this forum to a close. Uh, on behalf of my colleagues here at Miami, the, the Journal News and the League of Women Voters, let me first thank our candidate, thank our candidates again for participating in tonight's event and for sharing their respective visions of Ohio's future. Uh, thank you as well to our supporting organizations throughout the region uh, for their help in bringing tonight's event uh, together and 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 putting it yeah putting it together. And last but not least, let me thank everyone. Um, uh, we had over three to 400 people, uh, and that doesn't include some watch parties and things that, that we've heard about that, that tuned in tonight. So thank you for joining us this evening to hear what the candidates had to say. And, and um, 
immersing yourselves in, in the issues, basically. And just a reminder, early voting is now underway in Ohio. Absentee ballots can be requested anytime up through November 5th, and Election Day itself is Tuesday, November 8th, and we encourage you to, to vote and make your voice heard in our democracy. And with that said, uh, thank you again to everyone, and, and have a pleasant evening. Thank you guys as well for hosting. I really do appreciate it. Thank you. It's good, good to see day. you. You too.